I, I saw uh, Dr. Green as being a passionate advocate for education as a means to change the world. Certainly, some of his belief in making education more accessible to all of us, to everyone around the world, really is a foundation in my mind for how it is that we can really aggressively and diligently um, uh, use our work to change things, to make it so that no one is denied access to education. I also was impressed by the number of projects that the Creative Commons began to touch on. And just a few of them were things like projects to shift participation in education for women in the sciences, for uh, third world countries to become more involved in education. All of these are, are projects that, as I looked at the work of, of uh, Dr. Green, I began to see evidence of the thrust that he's really putting his energy into and was very impressed by that. Dr. Green is currently the Director of Global Learning for Creative Commons. He works with the global open community to leverage open licensing, open content, open policies, and the affordance of digital things to significantly improve access to quality and affordable education. And I love the concept of, of digital things. I saw that come up in, in a number of the web pages as, as I uh, went through. Uh, Cable is a strong advocate for open policies that ensure publicly funded education materials are freely and openly available to the public that pays for them. Previously as Director of E-Learning and Open Education for the Washington State Board for Community and Technical Colleges, he led a project to build and share highest enrolled courses under the Creative Commons license. They call it the Open Course Library. Cable also served as the Director of Technology for the Ohio Learning Network and Director of Educational Technology for the Ohio State University College of Pharmacy, where he built Ohio State's first online doctoral program. He earned his PhD in Educational Psychology at Ohio State University, um, and uh, his thesis was in studying how students learn, particularly related to their visualization and sharing of new learning. <laughs> Please join me in a very commotion, a warm commotion welcome for Dr. Cable Crane. Thank you. I think that's the first time that the person introducing me studied me the night before. <laughs> so I appreciate that. Thank you. Let me just get this set up here. So I was thinking this morning that this is definitely the best uh, conference of the year for me so far because this one is sold out. So, uh, and there's such a great history to this conference. How many of you have been before? Right. So it, what a community, right? To come back together year after year to see the great work that everyone uh, is doing is is uh, really a, a blessing. You should be uh, thankful and excited about this work. I, I I'll be here all day. Uh, watching your sessions and participating as well, and I'm eager to, to hear the good work that, that's happening uh, here in, uh, in British Columbia. So uh, this is what we'll talk about today, which is more than we can talk about in one hour. And so I'll do my best to hit the high points and keep the messages clean and crisp, as my colleague uh, David Porter likes to remind me. And, uh, and then if you would like to talk more, uh, please grab me in the hallway. Um, I'll be around throughout the entire day. I don't go back to Washington State until tomorrow. Uh, and here's my contact information. So if you want to talk more, there's my email. And uh, probably most important, my Twitter handle is at cgreen. And so if you want to know what I'm working on and what I'm thinking about and interesting stuff that I find around the world of good work that others are doing, that's where I put it. So I, I tweet it out there. <coughs> So before I get started, I always like to start with, what are we talking about? What's the point here? Uh, why do we care about open educational resources? Why do we care about education at all? And so uh, raise your hand if you're faculty. Good. We'll have a very good conversation. Instructional designers? Librarians? OK. Uh, others? Who else do we have in the room? <laughs> we have administrators. Who, what, are, what are some of the others? Instructors, who else? Instructional assistants. Instructional assistants, okay. But we all, we all have come to education for a particular set of reasons. We believe fundamentally that an education is better than not having an education. We believe that educated uh, people are generally good for society. We believe it leads to more peaceful societies. 
We believe and we understand that when people have an education, they have a better life, that they can, they can get a better job, that can lead to having a better income, they can, uh, they can do better uh, with, with uh, their family's economic situation. But we understand that an education is the pathway to, to a better life and to a better society. There's nobody in this room, uh, including me, who got into education because we got into it because we wanted to make money, right? If you wanted to go make money, you would have been an investment banker or done something else, right? That's not why we're in education. We fundamentally believe this. So, so I bring this up always first because uh, about 10 years ago, something interesting happened which led us to this conversation. So roughly 10 years ago, uh, there was a confluence of events. First of all, can everybody hear me okay? Yes. Good, okay. I'm loud, but I usually don't need one of these. So, uh, so what happened 10 years ago? Remember when the internet first became useful to you? When we first had browsers, uh, computers were getting cheap enough that many of you had computers not only at your work, but also at home. And so this was different. Students also started to get computers. Moore's Law was kicking in. We saw the cost of computers falling off a cliff. We saw bandwidth going up. We saw new mobile devices in our pockets that had incredi incredible computing power. All this started to happen roughly, roughly a decade ago. The internet became something that wasn't just a read platform, it was read-write. So we could contribute as well. And that was revolutionary. No, never before had we been able to be publishers as individual citizens. Right? And this shocked everybody, shocked the music industry, shocked education, shocked governments into thinking, well, what do we do with this new network? So that was one thing that happened. Another thing that happened in education is we realized that everything we were producing was digital. So it was born digital. So it, there was a point in time, you, you remember this, when we walked around with tape recorders or other things to record audio. We don't do that anymore. All the devices that we had a decade ago till today were digital recording devices, digital video, digital audio. When we made presentations like this, you used PowerPoint or some other presentation tool. You were building stuff on computers for education. The textbooks were digital. The, maybe we printed them out. We still print them out and sell them in bookstores, but they're built digitally. And the reason that's important is digital stuff has unique affordances that non-digital stuff does not. So this, right, was probably made in China. It doesn't say made in China, but I bet $10 that it is. And it had to be manufactured. It had to, you had to cut, probably a lot of oil had to be drilled for that thing to be made. And it had to be inventoried somewhere and put on a ship and shipped across and then somehow it got delivered here and there it sits, right? So there's a lot of costs along that supply chain. Digital things are different in that there are production costs. So it costs something to make a digital thing. We all know that. And there are maintenance costs to keep it up to date. But the rest of the costs in the supply chain go to zero. Not quite zero, but so close to zero we call it zero. So the costs of storage, the costs of replication, and the costs of distribution are very expensive costs when you're moving around stuff. They cost zero to move around digital things. Let me say that again, storage, think about cloud computing and how much hard drive space you have today compared to what you had a decade ago. Think about replication. How much does it cost me to make a million copies of this PowerPoint slide deck? Nothing, right? And then how much does distribution cost on the internet? It costs something because I'm paying an internet service fee, but really the marginal cost is zero. So that was interesting. We had, we had the stuff we were building cost nothing to share, store, and replicate. And we had this global network where we could send, send this information to people around the world at near the speed of light. That was interesting. The other thing that happened 10 years ago is Creative Commons started. So while we could, we could technically share the educational resources that we all built and used, there was no legal protocol for doing so. So I'll, uh, I'll ju I'm jumping ahead just a touch. Uh, but the punchline is Creative Commons started, and we'll talk a little bit about what that means. That gave us, it made it easy to legally share all this stuff uh, on the web. And so what happened were people asked the question 10 years ago, if what we're creating is digital and we've got the technological and legal tools to share, should we? Remember the, the who are we, right? We're educators. What do educators do? We share knowledge. We build new knowledge. We push the boundaries of knowledge. We teach others about knowledge and we in turn are taught. Right? The whole point of being a teacher is to share. That's what we do as educators. Right? We share 
knowledge. When you write journal articles, when you go to academic conferences and present, all the presentations today, they're here to share knowledge because they want you to take the good work that they're doing and riff off it and use it and revise it and remix it and hopefully it'll be useful for you. That's what we do as educators. When your students come to your class, you're sharing knowledge and they're sharing with each other. Right? This, is, this is what education's about. So the question was called a decade ago uh, at a big UNESCO meeting and the, 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 the term open educational resources were, was coined. We'll come back to OER in a second. The other thing that happened that we really started to wake up to in the last uh, 20 years or so is the demand for education. So we know that if you've got a higher ed degree, your chances of being unemployed in a recession go way down. We know that your lifetime income goes way up. We know that societies that have uh, a higher percentage of their population uh, being educated have fewer conflicts. We know all these things, right? Uh, what, what was a bit of a shock over the past 20 years or so was this, was the massive demand for higher education and more to the point, our inability to meet that demand with our existing structures. So think about our existing structures, our brick and mortar structures we have admissions policies, we simply don't have enough space uh, or systems in place to serve everyone who wants to get a higher education degree. Okay, now Canada is much better than, than uh, many other countries, uh, but we've got this bow wave coming globally uh, where there's been a real effort through United Nations efforts over the past decade to have universal primary education, but we don't have universal secondary or tertiary education waiting for them. So this is a problem. So I'll let you read this, but ask yourself, what do you think the odds are that the world's gonna build four major universities that serve 30,000 students each, and they'll open every week for the next 15 years, right? Probably not gonna happen. Even in the countries like China and Brazil and India, where they're double, tripling down on their educational investments right now on universities and colleges and technical colleges. There simply isn't enough capacity in the world to serve all the people that want to get an education. Now, the scary part of this is ask yourself, if those people who want to get an education and have a better life don't get the opportunity to do so, what happens to them? Right? And in many cases, it's not uh, a pleasant story. So the good news is this isn't, uh, there weren't just a few people that had these crazy ideas. Many people had these crazy ideas. Uh, David and Sybil and many others around the world said, now wait a minute, there's an opportunity here. When we can share digital stuff at the marginal cost is zero and, and we can get high quality educational resources to anybody who wants them, should we do that? And more to the point, how do we do that and how fast can we do that? And so uh, in 2006, my current boss, she's the CEO of Creative Commons, her name's Kathy Casserly. Kathy worked at the Hewlett Foundation. And the Hewlett Foundation, she was a program officer there. And her job was to give away money to new projects that helped humanity. That was her job description. And Kathy got this idea about uh, open educational resources with many others around the world. And Hewlett started to fund these ideas. So this was a quote from Kathy in, in 06. She said, at the heart of the movement toward open educational resources is the simple and powerful idea that the world's knowledge is a public good and that technology in general and the web in particular provide an opportunity for everyone to share, use, and reuse it." End quote. The next year there was a meeting in Cape Town, South Africa, and again, all these crazy people from around the world got together and said, let's formalize these ideas in a declaration. Let's talk about what's possible. Uh, Archbishop Desmond Tutu hosted this meeting. This was a high level meeting and the first sentence, which I'm sure you can't read there, says, we are on the cusp of a global revolution in teaching and learning. Educators worldwide are developing a vast pool of educational resources on the internet, open and free for all to use. These educators are creating a world where each and every person on earth can access and contribute to the sum of all human knowledge. Right, so as, as, as crazy as these ideas sound, these are not crazy ideas anymore. You gotta remember, Wikipedia also started 10 years ago, and when it came out, everybody said, well, that's garbage, and why would anybody go to that trash if you could go to this wonderful resource over here called Britannica, or Microsoft Encarta? Well, you saw what happened to Microsoft Encarta. They don't produce that anymore. And Britannica never had more than about 60 or 80,000 employees, even at their height, and they're scaling down rapidly. And they, don't, they won't even sell you printed stuff anymore. You can only subscribe to their digital resources. And whereas they have maybe 100,000 articles 
Wikipedia has tens of millions of articles in languages all over the planet. How do you compete with that? Right? That's, that's free and open sharing of knowledge. <clears throat> so I mentioned Creative Commons. We also started 10 years ago. The problem was this. So the problem 10 years ago was stuff could be in the public domain, which was good, because if it's in the public domain, you can just take it, use it, you can do anything you want, you don't have to ask permission, there's no cost, there's no attribution requirements, you just use it, right? That's helpful. On the other side of the spectrum, we had all rights reserved copyright. That's good too, right? Copyright, you, you produce something, uh, you should have your copyright protected for a period of time so that you can recoup the costs, make money, sell your book, whatever you want to do. And countries around the world have copyright law. There's nothing wrong with copyright law. The problem was that there was nothing in between. Do you know how, and maybe David will have to tell me what the law is in Canada. In the United States, you know how something gets in the public domain? It's not pleasant. First you have to die, and then after you're dead, you have to wait 70 more years. And if you're a corporation, you can get another 20 tacked onto that. Is it? It's death plus 50 in Canada? Oh, sorry. You all have to die, too. OK? So, so that wasn't good, because remember, 10 years ago, you had a bunch of people saying, I, got, I have the technical ability to share, and I'm an educator. It's what I do. I want to share educational content broadly. That's my, that's my goal. And I also have copyright. So this, this happened to me when I was at Ohio State. I was a professor. I taught a bunch of courses, including online courses. And I would put my courses up on my website. I would say, here, anybody in the world can have this. It's free, I would say. And then on the bottom it said, copyright, cable green, all rights reserved. <laughs> right? so, so what was the net result of that? Well, <clears throat> even people who liked my work and wanted to take it wouldn't touch it with a 10-foot pole. Why not? Because it was copyright, all rights reserved, and even though I said, here, it's free, if they tick something and violated my copyright, I could have taken them to court, and I would have won. Right? And so that was a problem. It, we didn't have anything in between. So that's what Creative Commons is. Creative Commons is a simple, standardized way to grant some rights and some permissions that you choose. It's not all rights reserved. It's some rights reserved. Now, the, the most common misconception of Creative Commons is that when you put a Creative Commons license on your syllabus, your course, your video, your textbook, whatever it is that you want to share as an educator, a lot of people think that you have to give up your copyright, that you're losing your ownership. And that's not true. So that's, that's the beauty of Creative Commons is that you keep your copyright. And what you're doing is you're adding a license to your copyright, you're sharing some rights and some permissions. So, and you get to choose what you share and what you don't share with everyone else. So, with Creative Commons, you have these, uh, there are these four conditions. The first one is not optional. So, attribution is required. And we understand that in the academy, right? If I use your work, I should give you credit. I should say, thank you, I, I use this. And here's a link back to, uh, to your good work on your website, right? We expect that. We do that when we write journal articles and we cite each other, right? That's what we're doing is we're giving proper attribution. So attribution's not an option. It's required on all the Creative Commons licenses. The other three are optional. So a lot of people just stop with attribution. They say, all I, all I want is attribution, anything else you can do. Uh, the next one's called share alike. Share alike says, if you take my work and you modify it, you make a derivative work, you change it in a substantive way, you create something new, that that new thing that you produce must be licensed under the same terms that I licensed my work under. So it's a way to sort of force sharing forward. This is what Wikipedia uses. They use the Creative Commons attribution share alike license. Okay? The next one is non-commercial. It's what it sounds like. You can take my work, you can use it for free, you can copy it, you can redistribute it, you can even change it, but you may not sell it. So you can't put it up on the website and charge $19.95 for it and sell it to other people. Now this one, this, this term is confusing, uh, especially in education to us, and so let me make a couple things clear. One is that uh, you're a nonprofit institution, yeah? Okay, so uh, nonprofit education institutions using other people's Creative Commons license work that have non-commercial licenses on them, uh, safe, that's safe ground. If you ever have any question, the, the best thing to do is just to contact the copyright holder and say, hey, we're, we're, we'd like to use this in our course, but 
<coughs> but there's been uh, studies that we've done at Creative Commons surveying the community. That's safe use. Really what people are getting at here with commercials, they don't want commercial entities that are for profit to pick up their work and sell it. That's really what they're trying to discourage. The last one here is no derivatives. That says you can take my work, you can use it for free, et cetera, but you may not change it. You can't make a, you can't revise it or remix it. Now that's a problem for us in education. <clears throat> and so in education, we try to discourage our colleagues from using the no derivatives license because, uh, because as educators, that's what we do. We change stuff, right? We take a little bit of this and a little bit of this and we modify it and we make something new. So if you mix and match these uh, different conditions together, here's what you get. You get one of these six uh, open copyright licenses. And again, you're not giving up your copyright, you're just saying which rights and permissions you choose to extend to everybody else on the planet. So when you hear people say CC BY, here's what they mean. It's Creative Commons attribution. BY is like, it's BY David Porter, right? David's the author, it's BY him. BY SA would be attribution share alike, non-commercial, BY ND, right, you get it. So no, ND is no derivatives, SA is share alike. So you can mix and mash and choose the license that you want. Now, a, a caution to all of us as educators, the, to the extent that your goal is to share, think about the degrees of freedom that you're giving to other people who might want to use your stuff. And do you want to maximize the flexibility that you're giving those people? The, more, the closer you are to the bottom where it says least free, when I say free here, I'm not talking about cost. I'm talking about degrees of freedom. Right? How much freedom are you extending to others? Uh, those are really the least free licenses. They're very locked down on the bottom to the most free at the top. And as you can see, public domain is certainly the most free because it doesn't even require attribution. And th this tool at the top, we actually have a protocol called CC0 so that you don't have to die and wait 50 years if you want your work to go in the public domain. You can just use the CC0 protocol and put your work into the public domain immediately. Now, most people don't want to do that. They want to retain their copyright and share if, if that's your goal, then keep your copyright by all means and choose one of the licenses to add to it. Does that make sense? Yeah. Wow. Well, you get it faster than most people do. That's great. <laughs> so in education, we really try to stay up toward the top. We try to stay up around CC BY or BY SA. Uh, NC can be confusing, so to the extent that you're able to stay away from NC, that's a good thing. And you really want to stay away from the ND licenses. Now there are reasons to use NC, there are reasons to use ND, but if you can avoid them, my recommendation would be to avoid them. Right? More, if your goal is for other people to use your stuff, they'll use your stuff more if you're closer to the top. Okay. So one of the reasons why Creative Commons licenses have really become the global standard for open copyright licensing is that, um, is that they're, they work in every country in the world. We've got teams in 70 countries around the world and we're adding new teams all the time. They're called Creative Commons affiliates. But our licenses are also available in these three layers. So uh, any lawyers in the room? Good, let's talk about them. So, so lawyers love this bottom one, right? It's the legal code, it's this big nasty 25 page, here's all the details, legal details of the license. It's comforting for all of us to know it's there because if somebody ever violates our copyright, they violate the terms of our license, our Creative Commons license, then they've actually violated our Canadian copyright and you could take that person to court and you would win. In fact, Creative Commons, if you're interested, type in Creative Commons case law in Google and you'll see all the court cases around the world and Creative Commons licenses have never ever lost in court. Why? Well, these licenses are written by the best legal minds around the world. Uh, Creative Commons was started by law professors from Stanford, Harvard, Yale, other universities that have quite good law schools, including uh, Open University in England and others all participated in creating the licenses. And in fact, our licenses right now are versioning from three to version four. After a decade, that's where we are, is version four. And we've got about a thousand people uh, around the world, uh, lawyers, working on these licenses to make absolutely sure that they work in every country on the planet. So that's important. But those are lawyers, right? The rest of us are humans, right? So I love this. It's like lawyers aren't humans. Human readable deeds are, are very simple. And let me just hop out real quick to, uh, to the web and I'll show you what I mean. So if I go to, uh, I'm just on Creative Commons homepage. <coughs> if I'm still online, maybe I'm not online. That's okay, I'll come back to it. 
So the human readable deed is, uh, is, is simple, right? It's written at a grade six level. It's not even full sentences, it's like bullet points. Here are, your, here are the freedoms that you have under the following conditions. So the CC BY license, for example, at the top, it says you are free to distribute this, you can make copies, you can even make commercial use of this if you want to. Under the following conditions, you must give credit. You must give attribution to the person whose work this is. So that's the human readable deed. And then the machine readable layer is, is really important as well. We all know that uh, the internet uh, is run by servers and computers and the, these things read code, right? All the websites we look at, it's got code behind it. Our licenses have code embedded in them with a lot of information. It says, this is the license that has been chosen. Here's the author. So here's how you give attribution. Here's the, here's the URL of the work so that when you give attribution, you know where to link to that thing. So if you go to Google, for example, and you go to Google Advanced Search, you can say, I'm looking for algebra textbooks. And if you go to the bottom, you can filter by usage rights, it says. And what is Google searching on? Searching on Creative Commons licenses because it can read that machine readable code. Right, so that's one value. Again, to the extent that you're an educator, your intent is to share your resources. If you put a Creative Commons license on your work, you make it easy for people around the world to use the tools that they already use and find your work easier. So is there anything, is anybody doing this? Well, yeah, and in fact, this is a very, very low estimate because we have poor metrics right now. This is a major problem Creative Commons is working on because we want uh, David and his colleagues in, uh, at BC campus who are leading this fabulous open textbooks project, which David will talk about later, um, we want David to be able to ask the question and get a nice little chart that says, how many people have downloaded that BC uh, open textbook, that open algebra textbook? And what languages has it been translated into? And how many derivative works have been made? So that David can go back to the, the British, uh, the British uh, Columbia government and say, here are the metrics on the investment that you made. Here's, here's how it served students in British Columbia. Here's how much money it saved them. And, and by the way, here's who else in the world is using it. Right? So we're working on uh, new products around the Creative Commons licenses right now. And I know I, I should say some of you are thinking, uh, this all sounds great. How much does it cost? Uh, the answer is nothing. This is all free. You can get licenses and just use them. Uh, and then the next question is always, uh, well, this sounds it, free. can't be. Uh, where do you get your money from? Are you some corporate stooge and is this a trick? Um, which is a fair question. And uh, the answer is that Creative Commons is funded in three ways. One is foundations around the world just give us money because they're glad we exist and we do work like this. And so they just write us checks, which is nice. Uh, we also do projects, but only projects that are in line with our mission. And I'll talk about some of those later. And third, we do a little uh, fundraiser, which doesn't make much money every year. But that's how we're funded. <laughs> so of course, the, and then there are big adopters, right? I mentioned Wikipedia. They have just uh, a little bit of information uh, in, in only a few languages up on their website. I mentioned that uh, Creative Commons is global and that the licenses work everywhere. Um, here is a quick map, and you can see Canada up, that, up there. These are countries that have teams uh, of people. These are volunteers. Uh, who do this because they care and they want uh, others in their country to understand the principles of openness and to understand Creative Commons and to understand open educational resources and open access journals and open science and public sector information data out of government that should all be openly available to the taxpayers who paid for this information. Right, so we've got teams all around the world. Here's the, the different areas that Creative Commons works in. Education, that's the, the area that I work in most, but we also work in science and data, governments, culture, uh, galleries, libraries, arts and uh, archives and museums, and media platforms. Platforms is key because, um, yes, you can go to the Creative Commons website and get your license, and I'll show you how to do that. It's not difficult. Uh, but what's even easier is if the, you can add a license on the platform that you're already on. So anybody ever shared their slides on slideshare.net? Put your PowerPoints up there. Oh, good. Well, you learned something new today. You can share your slides on slideshare.net. And before you build your next slide, share, or slide deck, go to slideshare.net and take somebody else's, right? It'll save you lots of time. Uh, and on slideshare.net, people can add a Creative Commons license right there when they upload their slides. And you can go to your settings and say, from now on, don't ask me anymore. Just put a Creative Commons attribution license on my slides every time I upload slides. Right? You can do the same thing on YouTube. You, you, anybody use YouTube? 
right? You go to YouTube, you got two choices. You can have the standard YouTube license, or you can have a Creative Commons attribution license. If you put a Creative Commons attribution license on it, it'll tag it, it'll, it'll put that machine readable license on it so that people can find it on the web easier, and it throws your video into a mix of videos on YouTube that can be remixed because other people have the legal rights to remix your video now. If that's something you want to enable, that's important. Uh, I just worked with Apple, so if you use iTunes U, you can upload uh, your, your thing to iTunes U, and you can just write, there's a pull down menu. We're working with the MOOCs right now, with Coursera and Udacity and Future Learn in England, and the European Union just launched a new set of MOOCs. We'll be talking with them next week. And same thing, when you're using a MOOC, here's a pull down menu, add your Creative Commons license. Right, so we try to keep it really, really simple. Flickr's another one. Anybody ever use Flickr? Good. So I'll ask the academic dean to close his ears here. Uh, how many of you have gone to the web and just grabbed an image for your slide deck and you didn't really look at who owned it? You just put it in because you thought it was a pretty picture. <laughs> He's not listening. It's okay. Good. <laughs> and you should be very thankful there are no lawyers in the room because they'd be all over your case right now. <laughs> Because not only are you putting yourself at legal risk, but you're actually putting this institution at serious legal risk every time you do that. So instead of doing that, a better thing to do is go to Flickr and go to the advanced search. And when you're searching for images, filter your search by, say, only show me Creative Commons licensed images. Now, A, now you're legal, so that's good, and nobody's going to sue you. But remember, you've got an obligation here. And your obligation is to give proper attribution. So, so, you know, we'll show you how to do that uh, in a minute, but you want to make sure that you say this is, you know, here's the license and here's the person that, that uh, built this and here's the link back to their image on Flickr. It's not hard, but we give proper credit. That's what we do as educators. So um, lots and lots going on. Uh, so this is, we've talked about the conditions. Uh, people around the world have been sharing now for a decade with all these ideas. And in higher education, entire universities and colleges are sharing. And so uh, this started with uh, MIT. Uh, one of Hewlett's first grants was to MIT, and MIT threw its doors open and said, here's all of our courses. Now, it took them a while to do it, but now over 2,100 courses from MIT, which is their entire curriculum, is online, and you can go have it. And it's got a Creative Commons uh, license on it. And you can take it, repurpose it, and reuse it, and do whatever you want with it, as long as you comply with the terms of the license. Now, their license is the attribution, share-alike, non-commercial. So it's a fairly restrictive license. What that means is you have to give them credit. If you make a derivative work, you must relicense your work under the same terms, and you may not use it for commercial use. But who you are, you're fine, right? You may use it under those terms. And it wasn't just MIT. People looked at MIT and said, you're nuts. Uh, now nobody will go to MIT, and everybody's just going to steal MIT stuff. Uh, and, you know, you shouldn't have done that. Well, now there are... Uh, there are literally hundreds of colleges and universities and education systems around the world who are opening up either their entire curriculum or big chunks of their curriculum. So the Open University in England, many of you probably know, 5% uh, of all their reserves, and they're adding more all the time, are under a Creative Commons license. And these folks spend millions of dollars building each uh, course and program with all the textbooks. It's just fabulous, fabulous resources. Uh, if I were starting a new college or university today, the first thing I would do is scrape uh, all this great open courseware from around the world and use it as my core curriculum. It would save a lot of time and money. There's some really wonderful things out there. The problem is, and I'm sure David will talk more about this, is that we, uh, and I speak respectfully here, but we need to drop our arrogance. We oftentimes want to build all of our own stuff, and we want to share what we build and say, look, look how great we are, which is Good, that's a positive thing to share with the commons that way. But we also need to be humble enough to say, you know what, uh, not all the smartest people in the world are in the room right now. Now, most of them are, I'll give you that. <laughs> but there are smart people elsewhere in the world, and if they too are willing to share under an open license, we should take a look at that stuff. So let me give you an example. Uh, David and I were just talking about this. Um, this is a project that I started uh, in Washington State. It's called the Open Course Library. And what we did was we said, we're going to have the entire general education curriculum, our highest enrolled 81 courses, uh, freely available under a Creative Commons attribution license. And uh, we're doing it for us because our students need the best curriculum from around the world. Uh, textbooks are too expensive, so we set a cap of $30. Textbooks cannot cost more than $30. Publishers didn't like this conversation very much, and we said, that's tough. 
These are new rules. Uh, we are going to take advantages of the affordances of digital things. We're going to take advantage of the technologies of the day. We're going to take advantage of open licensing. And if it doesn't fit your business model, that's not our problem. Our job is not to sustain old business models. Our job is to make sure that students, and as many students as possible, get access to high quality educational content and learning experience. That's our mission. Right? So they just released yesterday their next, their second half of their 81 courses. So the, the next 31 courses are up. If you go to Creative Commons blog, you'll see this. And you can go to opencourselibrary.org and you can download all their courses. Everything they built is under a CC BY license. But my, the point of telling this story is that before we built anything, I said, everybody back away from the keyboards. Let's talk about what's already out there. So we didn't build new textbooks if the open textbooks already existed and we could modify them because they had an open license on them. We didn't build new courses if the pieces of the courseware we already needed were already there. We didn't build new simulations for chemistry or biology because the FET group at the University of Colorado Boulder has already done that better than anybody else on the planet and all those different resources are under a Creative Commons license. So we saved ourselves years of development and millions of dollars by just being humble enough to say, we're going to use what other people have been kind enough to share with us. Right? So whenever people ask me, what's the first step? Uh, it doesn't really matter. In the end, you want to do both. You want to give and contribute, and you also want to uh, take. Right? And in fact, believe it or not, taking, getting other people to reuse existing OER is, after a decade is proving to be the hardest, hardest thing. So if all you do for the next five years at this college is take other people's stuff, that'll be very helpful to the global OER community. <laughs> this is also playing out big time in elementary education. Uh, I was in uh, Alberta. Anybody from Alberta? Yep, a few people. Okay. So I was in Alberta, uh, I don't know, when were we there? December? December. Last December. And we were talking with higher ed, but, but uh, elementary education folks were in the room and they were about to make an Alberta-wide K-12 buy of textbooks. And they were going to spend $212 million buying textbooks. And these books were going to have to last for a decade. So think about that in today's world. Information being static in a fixed expression of a paper book, and we're going to keep that knowledge and teach it to our citizens for a decade? What kind of thinking is that? Right? Not to mention the fact that they were going to spend $212 million and are they going to own the copyright to any of that? No, right? They're not. The, the, the publishers hold all the copyright. What you have is a book. Now, there's a first sale principle, so you own the book. But anything that's digital, they don't own any of that copyright. Right? All that stuff is time bombed. The publishers own the copyright. So terrible, terrible system. And it's not, not, not picking on Alberta. Everybody does this. Right? This, is, this is bad. I'll show you what my state does in a minute. Good news is there's lots of activity. And we don't have time today, but there are literally hundreds of OER projects around the world. If you want a nice smattering of them, go to creativecommons.org slash education, and we've got links out to a lot of them uh, around the world. Now, I've thrown around this term a lot, OER, but we haven't actually defined what we mean by this. Let's be clear. So open educational resources are all this stuff that we use in education. And, but here's what's important. They've got to have two characteristics to be OER. <clears throat> One is they have to be free, meaning no cost. You've got to be able to access them at no cost. And two, you must have the legal rights to change those resources. So the, the Creative Commons no derivatives licenses, those are not acceptable OER licenses. Even though they're Creative Commons licenses, ND does not meet this definition. Okay, the rest of the conditions do. Some people would argue that NC violates this, this but that's a debate in the community. Um, so, but nevertheless, you've got to be free and you've got to be open. And the open is, it's either in the public domain or it has an open copyright license on it that gives you the legal rights to do four things. We call these the four R's. You have to be able to reuse, revise, remix, and redistribute. So reuse is I'm going to take your work and just use it as it is. Revise is I'm going to take your work and make some modifications to it, tweak it a little bit. Remix is I'm going to take some of your work and some of yours and some of yours and some from the Open University in England and some from Mongolia and I'm going to mash it together and create something new. That's a remix. And redistribute, I'm going to share that new thing I've built with anybody else who might want to use it and take advantage of it. So if you don't have the legal rights to do those four things, if you do those four things and somebody can sue you, you don't have the legal rights. 
So today, if we found a Coursera course that we really liked, we want to download it and use it here, can we do that? It's free. What are you telling? It's called a MOOC, Massive Open Online Course. Right, you're correct, right? That's all rights reserved copyright. And so you do that, you're going to get sued and you're going to lose. And so that's not OER. Now we're working with the MOOCs to get them to change their tune, but it's a bit of a conversation. Now, other things are happening which are interesting around policy is that uh, the foundations around the world, and this is something that we are active in, is we're working with every foundation that we can get a meeting with to basically say, uh, you're a foundation, your intent is to make the world a better place. You give out grant money in different areas to do that. Please require an open license on your grantees when they take your money and build something. Doesn't matter what it is. They're building educational content, they should share what they build. Or don't give them the money. Right? That's called an open policy. So foundations are starting to adopt that. You go to Gates Education, you go to Hewlett, you go to Shuttleworth, you go to uh, MacArthur, they will actually require that you put a Creative Commons attribution license on your work if you take their money. Now that's a good thing for all of us, right, who don't get those grants. We can still use those resources that are produced with grant funds. Uh, we already talked about search and discovery. Some of these things are really important uh, when it comes to openly licensed materials. So the ability to translate something. <clears throat> so I was working with, um, I was talking with somebody in India uh, a couple nights ago and uh, she said, I found a lot of materials that I'd like to use, but they're all in French and they're all in English and they're all in German and I need them uh, to be in local dialects uh, in India for different provinces. And how do I do that? And do I have the legal rights? And the answer is yes, you can make translations, but only if there's an open license on it. If it's all rights reserved, a translation is a derivative work. You've just violated somebody's copyright. So the ability to make translations are key. Accessibility. Uh, what's your law in Canada? What do you call it for educational resources must be accessible? You don't have one? Not a national law. Oh, my goodness. So. In the US, we have a national law that says if you're a student with a disability and you go to a college or university, that college or university has a legal, uh, a federal legal responsibility to provide the resources to you in the way that you can access them. So if I'm blind, uh, you have to provide the resources to me in a way that I can be a full participant in the class. And so again, if there's an open license on it, and maybe I haven't had the time to make my resources fully accessible to students regardless of what their disability might be or, their, uh, or the way that they learn, uh, you can take my work and you can make it more accessible. But this is probably the most important thing. I would argue in the 21st century, I don't care if you're an instructor, you're a professor in higher ed, you're an elementary school teacher. If you don't have the legal rights to customize works for your students in the context that you're teaching, localize it, translate it, whatever you need to do, if you don't have those legal rights, then you're working with the wrong educational content. Because this is what we do as educators. We take a little bit from here and a little bit from over there, and we know our students. We know what economic environment uh, we exist in. We know where the jobs are. We know how we need to present those materials, in what order, et cetera. And if you don't have the ability to do with your content what you need to do, uh, then that's a problem. So we talked a little bit about policy and what the foundations are doing. Oh, Paul's here. Hey, Paul. <laughs> it's good to see you. Uh, so policymakers, not just foundations, but governments around the world are starting to clue into these ideas, right? They took them a while to realize that there was this thing called the internet and they're just figuring out how to use it and they're just figuring out that digital things have these unique affordances, but they haven't put all these things together. And for them, it boils down to this, this simple idea of rivalrous versus non-rivalrous resources. Politicians and governments uh, make a lot of their decisions based on the idea that resources are limited, that there's a fixed amount, and that they're rivalrous. Meaning if I take something, if I take part of your budget, your budget just went down. It's a, it's a, uh, it's a zero sum game, if you will. The, uh, what's interesting about digital things is that it's not a zero sum game. It's, it follows the expanding pie theory, which is actually when I share something that's digital with you, uh, the resource between us actually becomes more valuable. And the more I share my resource and the more people that use my textbook, for example, the better that resource can get because we've got more minds on it. I can talk with you. We can have a relationship. We might have new partnerships, which yields new grants. I mean, all sorts of things can happen when we share. And this is a new concept for 
for, uh, for a lot of politicians. And so it's part of our responsibility. When I, say, when I say government, I include all levels. So I'm talking about national governments, provincial governments. I mean your system of education that your college is in. And I mean the college uh, administration. And I'm talking about department chairs all the way down to individual faculty. You can make policy decisions about what you do at this institution or at your institutions that, that can have very positive effects. So for example, when I was in the community colleges in Washington State, we had 34 colleges and we had this discussion and we created a policy which said from now on, we drew the line in a Jan you know, July 1st of this year, from now on, if anybody takes an optional discretionary grant from the system, they will, by requirement of all the grants, put a Creative Commons attribution license on what they build. Now, it wasn't a lot of money. It's $10, $20 million a year that flows through this pipeline of optional grants. And they build all kinds of things, workforce education and new professional development activities and adult basic education. And they built all sorts of stuff, new, new e online courses. But we said, you keep the copyright, right? We'll give you the money. You keep the copyright. And you've got to share what you build because this is money. This is a gift to you and everyone should benefit. We set our own policy. We didn't need the state to tell us to do this. We didn't need the federal government to tell us to do this. We chose to do this. Okay, so don't wait for politicians to set these rules. So have these discussions in your own departments, in your own institutions. So as you're having these conversations, some of this might be helpful. The cost of copying and distribution, as we've said, copying, distribution, and storage have essentially fallen to zero. Here's what the cost of copy looks like today. What I want you to look at is the bottom one. How much does it cost to copy a 250-page textbook by computer? Is it zero? No, but it's close enough, right? At 0 .00084 cents, your, uh, your academic uh, lead over here, VP, is saying, I can cover that out of my budget, right? <laughs> for all the students at the college, we can, we can cover those costs for textbooks. Uh, cost of distribution, again, by internet, 0 .00072. Not free, but close enough. You look at the alternative. Anybody walk through your bookstore lately? Anybody from the bookstore here? <laughs> bookstore is here. Yeah. So. Yes. Have you walked through the bookstore recently? <laughs> okay. Uh, the the highest enroll or the top selling 50 books in your bookstore, the cost of those books is right around 150 Canadian dollars, give or take. That's the average cost of the books. Your students spend on average about a thousand dollars a year plus or minus on their books, right? And think about that in terms of how much that is in relation to the tuition. Uh, think about the debt that your students graduate with when they leave your institution <laughs> with debt or they go on to another degree and they accumulate more debt. In the United States, we just passed $1 trillion of student debt. Uh, so that's greater than all the credit card debt in all of the United States. Yes? Are you taking questions? Absolutely. Absolutely. So I'll punt on the, the hardware question. Let's talk in the hallway about that. Because you're right, that's a, it's, a, it's a big issue. Um, and you're also right, it, this, this analysis does not factor in the costs of production or of maintenance of those digital things, which are still high. However, if you, even if you spend a lot of money building a, a digital resource and maintaining it, if you amortize that over the, the number of students that are using it and compare those numbers to what we do today, it's shocking at how wasteful we are in terms of how much money we spend on, on content, educational content today. But let's talk more in the hallway, if that's OK. So, so the point is that this changes things. Now, one of the things that's a truism of higher ed is that we have not been fundamentally disrupted by these technologies of the last 10 years, and other industries have. So we all know what's happened to music, right? When was the last time you bought an album or even a CD, <laughs> right? We, she's like, I like CDs, thank you very much. <laughs> but a lot of people buy songs one at a time now, 
And I don't even buy songs for 99 cents anymore. I just subscribe to these music services that look like this, right, where you can pay eight, nine, ten dollars a month and you get access to kind of all of the songs, not just the one for 99 cents, but ev everything. That's not everything, but it's mostly everything. And I don't know about you, but 15 million songs is enough for me, right? It, it got me from Olympia, Washington to here without listening to the same song twice. So uh, these are industries, and by the way, here's what it looks like for movies and television, right? You can, th these are US examples, but you can <laughs> essentially get access to lots and lots of movies and television, if that's your thing, for those kinds of numbers. Now compare that to uh, what we have in higher education that's digital. So Course Smart is, are there any publishers in the room? <laughs> I was with Pearson last week. I have to be careful what I say. Uh, <laughs> this is being recorded, isn't it? <laughs> so, so uh, CourseSmart is one of the big distribution arms of the textbook publishers and their new model to also take advantage of digital things is to essentially lease you digital textbooks. Uh, not you, your students. And the pitch is, hey, good news. The textbook used to be $150 in the bookstore. We'll lease it for you for $80. Sounds like a great deal. What happens at the end of the semester when the students stop paying their, uh, their $18.49 a month? Poof, the access goes away, right? Again, go back to what, what are we talking about here as educators? We're talking about sharing knowledge, maybe even acquiring the knowledge and keeping it for future reference. Uh, the idea that we have to give up access to knowledge after we stop paying for it, especially at those high costs, is ridiculous. Now, the analysis here, if you haven't picked up on it, is for $20 a month, you can get access to kind of all the songs that have ever been written, plus uh, most of the movies for 20 bucks a month, or you can lease English 101 textbook, <laughs> right? Which industries have been properly disrupted by technologies? I'll leave that to you. Okay, so the question for us is, you know, when we can share at the marginal cost of zero. Still production costs, still hardware costs, right? There's still recycling issues and all that. Uh, but when we can do this, should we? What should governments do? What should we do as faculty? Ten minutes, great. So, um, and we need to realize what our students are doing. So this is a study out of Florida. These numbers have actually been updated recently by a new study out of California, uh, which is essentially says students today are not buying books even when you assign them. So in Florida, 60% of students didn't purchase at least one textbook. In California, the number got jacked up to 70, okay? For a lot of reasons. You, you ask students and the students will say, well, they're just not worth it. It's too expensive and when I try to sell the book back, I get 10% of the cost and I'm really angry about that and so I'm just not gonna buy the books anymore. And so we have students that are going into the learning environments that you have so carefully crafted and put together the resources that you want them to learn and they don't have the educational resources they need to learn. Okay, another interesting thing about this project, this was a, a project called Kaleidoscope where the whole point of it was to take existing OER, not change it very much, put it in a community college and see if it would be successful or not. And so what you saw here is not only did, and, and here was the vision. Everybody, every learner should have access to all the resources that they need on day one. Now this is especially critical when you're talking about, you guys have developmental math students and developmental writing students, right? Uh, these students are already challenged. You know that oftentimes they don't get their financial aid check until week two or three of the course. That's when they can go buy the books. So these, these kids are already bad at math. Now they're three weeks in to your quarter or semester, and now they're able to buy their resource. Now they're three weeks behind. How do you think they're gonna do in the class, right? So the whole point of this project was, let's give everybody open educational resources that are high quality on day one, and what'll happen? So you can see here the students rated that very well. The students said we'd, much, we'd prefer more classes like this as compared to all of our other courses. And then this is a, an analysis of the actual learning outcomes. How did students do? And there were upticks in all of the Kaleidoscope courses as compared to the control courses. And so, you know, can you say that it was the OER that made students do better? No, nobody's making that claim, but it certainly didn't do harm, right? So, and we saved students uh, hundreds of thousands of dollars because they weren't buying $150 textbooks for all their courses. So that's a good thing. And they all had their resources on day one. That's a good thing, okay? So the reason this is so important is this is what the numbers look like. This is the global economy, even in a recession. 5% is what we spend on education on average in countries, so we spend globally $3 trillion a year on education. 
Now, not all, that, you know, a lot of that's bricks and mortars and all sorts of other things, salaries and benefits, but hundreds of billions of dollars a year is in textbooks. So here's what's happening. Uh, British Columbia, California made some important moves recently. Uh, California said, you know what? This isn't working. Textbooks are not working for our students. Uh, we're not going to do this anymore. And so California is putting down $5 million. They're looking to get it matched by foundation, so they'll have $10 million. Their intent is to build 50 CC BY licensed open textbooks for their highest enrolled courses. You can take all 50. They're all yours. Right? They're just getting together now. They're starting the project. They'll build them over the next 12, 18 months. British Columbia looked at that and said, that's not a bad idea. Textbooks are expensive for our students too. Ministry of Education last year at the Open Education Conference, the minister stood up and said, uh, we also have a similar problem and we too will take public money and we will invest in the creation of up to 40 open textbooks and we'll look at highest enrolled courses and uh, what do you call them? Uh, high impact and circles, uh, industry circles, right? So we're going to look at where the jobs are as well. And what we just did is uh, Creative Commons and BC Campus and others came together in Vancouver a few weeks ago and we said, rather than building, not paying attention and building the same 50 courses, let's, or fa same 50 textbooks, let's coordinate our activities. So California, you build those 50. British Columbia will build these 40. But before anybody builds anything, let's look at all the existing open textbooks from CK12 in California and from OpenStax in Texas and from Siavula in South Africa because these folks have already spent millions and millions of dollars building CC BY licensed open textbooks that we can use and modify to meet our needs. And so instead of 50, instead of 100, now we've got maybe 200 textbooks that we all have access to. And that was, you know, in about a day and a half of meetings, we, we solved that problem and we're off to a good start. So governments are starting to get into this conversation. The U.S. Department of Labor a few years ago announced that they're putting out $2 billion, that's not million, that's billion with a B, to U.S. community colleges to build state-of-the-art programs and courses for next generation jobs. So green technologies, advanced manufacturing, jobs that are not being outsourced overseas, high paying jobs, that was the idea. At, you can guess what they did. Everything that's being produced with this public money must be licensed under a Creative Commons attribution license. You don't like that? Don't apply for the grant, right? Now, what does that mean for your college? That means that there's probably a billion plus dollars of brand new state-of-the-art educational programs which will be freely available under a Creative Commons license that if you choose to use it, it's all yours. It's being created right now. I mentioned that part of the way that we're funded is by projects. The Gates Foundation has given Creative Commons a grant. Paul Stacy, who's back there, is leading this project. And Gates is paying us to support all these uh, community colleges in the United States to learn about OER, find existing OER, repurpose that OER, coordinate with each other, understand how to give proper attribution, all those things. So this is the idea. Publicly funded resources should be, should be openly licensed resources. You're publicly funded, this college? Raise your hand if your college is publicly funded. Now, now I want you to ask yourself, do you think, given that the good citizens of British Columbia have paid for the content that you're producing, they pay for your salaries, they pay for a lot of things that happen at your institutions, do we have any obligation to share what we build with those public funds? Okay. It, we should keep our copyright, right? The, the college should keep the copyright or the faculty, whoever owns it based on your local contract, that copyright should be held, but we should also share. And the beauty of it is no harm is gonna come to you when you do share, in fact, quite the opposite. When you're not sharing today on the web, you're obscure, you're unknown, and you frankly don't matter nearly as much as if you do share, right? Because there are people all around the world, all around British Columbia, all around Canada, who are eager to see the good work that you do. You come together in this conference every year and that's great and this group is sharing with each other all of your ideas, but you can do so much more if you openly license what you produce and even more important, if you take what other people are willing to share with you and you revise it, you make it better and you share that back as well. So I'm out of time. Let me punch on just a couple more here. Um, you got five minutes, right? She says, yeah, uh, give or take. Uh, <laughs> This was what we found offensive in our state, which led to the Open Course Library. 
This was our highest enrolled course. These numbers are actually low now. It's actually 60,000 enrollments, but you get the point. This is one state, one system. This is not the universities in Washington State. This is just the community colleges. One class, English 101. The students are spending 10 million a year on textbooks. Every year, 10 million a year. You know where that money comes from? A third of it comes from state financial aid, state tax money. I pay that. The other third comes from federal financial aid. Everybody in the United States pays for that third. And the, the, other, the final third comes out of the students' pockets. And that's either cash that they've made. Those are hard-earned dollars. These are community college students. They are poor. They don't have excess cash, so they're not happy about that. It probably kicked them out of college uh, for a period of time so they, had, they could work and make enough money and get back in. Right? Or it's debt. And they're graduating with debt that's going to saddle them. Right? We decided that was not a good idea. <laughs> right? And so we built the Open Course Library. Here's what's happening in my state with K-12 right now, with elementary education. This is the model that we have. I'll let you read the details. We spend $130 million a year on a million kids. We've got 12 grades. We've got about eight subjects per grade. I get particularly pissed off on this point because I have two kids in this system. Okay, so now back to the, the point of, yes, production is expensive and maintenance is expensive. Let's run the numbers, shall we? So we've got about 100 cells. We've got 12 grades, about eight subjects per grade. Follow me? I've got about 100 textbooks and curriculum and scope and sequence and supplemental resources and all those materials that I need for all those classes. Today, my model is I spend $130 million a year and that's what I get. I get 10-year-old books, paper only. Kids can't keep them. If a kid loses them, the parents have to pay 150 bucks to replace the book. That makes the kids afraid to use their educational resources and take them back and forth to school. My second grader cried the other day because I forced his book in his backpack and I said, you have to take your book to school. And he said, Dad, I don't want to because I'm afraid I'm going to lose it and it's going to cost you $150. Right? This is the educational environment we have, and this is what we're doing to our learners because we insist on perpetuating these models. So I went to our legislature and I said, here's what you're buying. Are you satisfied with the results? Now, we got 100 cells. What if, let's spend big. Let's spend a million dollars per course. What if the state put out million dollar RFPs? Anybody in the world can reply. The best bid, the best content at the lowest price will get the bid. Okay? And the state will spend 20% a year maintenance on all 100 courses, right? Net result is now every kid gets an updated resource, five digital formats for every device they've got. And if you don't have a device, here's a print copy because we can print them for less than $4 a book. And the message to the kids is we honor you as a learner. Here's a brand new resource. It's yours. You can keep all the digital versions forever because they have perpetual open licenses on them. And here's printed copies for you as well. You lose it, you don't have to tell your folks. We've got a stack of them over here because they cost less than $5 a piece. We'll give you a new one, right? And we're gonna update these every single year. And so no, you don't have a 10-year-old political science book that talks nothing about the Arab Spring and nothing about anything that's happened in the last decade. That is no longer acceptable in the 21st century when we've got these tools. Okay, so <laughs> last slide. We'll talk more in the hallway. So here's where we need to have a little backbone. There are forces out there that don't like this conversation. The, uh, I've been told that, yeah, anybody from Ontario? I've been told the textbook industry in Canada is in Ontario. They don't like this conversation. Why? because they make a lot of money on the old model. And, and to get to the new model is challenging for them, right? And we empathize with that, but that is not our problem, okay? This is our problem. The top bullet is our job. Our job is to make sure as many people as possible get a high quality education to the extent that we're using public dollars. We need to make sure that the resources we're producing are openly licensed so the public has access to what the public paid for. And the good news is other countries are doing this as well, so Canada can benefit from that. Everything else, including the existing business models, need be held secondary to that primary goal. And if they get in your way, push them over, right? And we will be helped. Creative Commons is there to help you do that. Now, a final quote from a friend of mine. In the 21st century, the opposite of open is no longer closed. The opposite of open is now broken. Thank you very much. Thank you.